A nightmare neighbour can make life hell. Not worth being alive. It was torture. It's totally wrecked my life. But when you don't know who you're living next door to, it can turn into something far more sinister. He had his face up the glass and he said, you cannot escape me. All of a sudden, my family are in serious danger from what I thought was just an old man. What happens when a disagreement between neighbours turns deadly? We didn't take it seriously. I wish we had, but we didn't. There was a significant number of shots. I remember that. He was never going to let it go until I think he put us into our grave. In a peaceful suburban street in Birmingham, Warren and Sherry Smith had made a home and were bringing up their young son, Lucas. We were together for a while and then moved in together. Sherry had made it a nice home, just basically quite happy there. Then one day in 2008, there was a new arrival on the street. I was sitting in my lounge watching the television and I looked out the window and I saw an elderly gentleman walking up my path and then the doorbell rang. So I opened the door and he said he had been offered the property next door and he wanted to have a look at the garden. I asked him why he was moving and he said that the neighbours were very noisy, always playing loud music and that he thought that they were drug dealers. And I basically thought, what a shame, I felt sorry for him. The new neighbour was 64-year-old Harry Street. A few weeks after their meeting, he moved in next door to the Smiths. So I walked over to the hedge to say hello to Harry. Introduced myself, I said, my name's Warren. That conversation, the first time I met him, was probably the most normal conversation we ever had. Harry had a wife and young daughter. She was really nice, a really nice lady. And we built a relationship, a friendship. Her daughter was about seven then, and my son was four. She was a real kind girl. But just two months after the Street family moved in, the Smiths got a knock on the door. It was a normal Friday night, and we were sitting there having a chat, and the doorbell rang. And I opened the door and the police were standing there. They said that they'd been called out because of a noise complaint from a neighbour, which was quite shocked about because we wasn't making any noise. We were sat, the two of us, in the kitchen talking. Radio was on, but low, and that was that. The Smiths say the police were satisfied there was no problem. But over the coming months, Harry repeatedly complained to them that Warren and Sherry were being overly noisy. So he complained about loud parties, he complained about banging on the wall, he complained about general antisocial behaviour. His overarching complaint was noise. At that point, all we knew was that we were dealing with an escalating neighbour dispute. So any occasion, if it was a birthday or if there was people around, then he'd call the police. We used to think, well, what do the neighbours think, you know? Many times I tried to, to, to talk to Harry after that, and I said, look, you know, sorry for making a noise. Here's my phone number. If you have any more problems or, or if there is any too much noise, just ring me. And uh, if there's any music on, we'll make sure we turn it down. But Harry seemed to be becoming even more interested in his neighbours. After a while, we noticed that Harry was copying everything we did. We had a shed fitted at the top of the garden. He had exactly the same shed fitted. Down to small things like we had a pool. He'd come back an hour later and he'd have exactly the same pool in his garden. I felt very wary of Harry. There was something that niggled me about him. And a year after he moved in, Sherry says she became more concerned about Harry Street's behaviour. It was about one o'clock in the morning and I couldn't sleep. 
and I was tossing and turning and in the end I just thought oh I'm gonna go downstairs and put the telly on in the conservatory so that I wouldn't wake Warren up. Eventually I must have just nodded off and the next thing I know I was awoke by an almighty bang. So straight away I got up and, and went to investigate. We were both sort of, again, looking at each other as if to say, what on earth was that? After a restless night, Warren woke up with one question on his mind. So I decided to go outside into the garden to find out what the noise was. And then I saw what it was immediately that made the bang. It was golf balls. Just clicked. I knew it was Harry had been throwing golf balls off the roof. That's what it was. That's what the lead banging was. I just started thinking, you know, this bloke's getting just weirder and weirder. So the next morning I went up to the hedge when Harry got out of his car and I said, Harry, why are you throwing golf balls? He wouldn't explain himself. He wasn't interested in talking to me. At the same time, Harry's own complaints about the Smiths now reached a whole new level. One Saturday, we, uh, we were sitting around having dinner when there's a knock on the door. And there's two police officers at the door. I asked them what, what the problem was and they said they've had a complaint that a woman was being attacked in the property. We couldn't believe it. We were just in total shock, to be honest. I think I did say to them, you know, look at me. Do I look like somebody that's been attacked? I think that's the point when we knew he was a knock guy. Warren decided to confront Harry. I banged his front door and I said, what are you playing at? Why are you calling police saying that people have been attacked in my house? He just muttered, mumbled, slammed the door in my face and went back in. I was fuming, to be honest. He was just trying to rag me up, and he was doing a good job. But no one was prepared for what was to come. Suddenly, Harry appears, hanging over the fence, holding a rifle. It's like a bomb going off. It was so loud. You would think something was about to come through the wall. There was no remorse in them eyes at all. I was just absolutely scared stiff. In South East Birmingham, Harry Street had been complaining about his neighbours for over a year. But Warren and Sherry felt he was the problem. He was odd. There was something just not quite right with him. But one evening in 2009, there was a new noise from next door. I went into the bedroom. It wasn't late, it was about nine o'clock. And there was... Harry was drilling through his bedroom wall um, with which was obviously a hammer drill. Didn't think that much of it at that point until the following morning. It's about 2.30 in the morning and I was fast asleep and there was the most terrific bang. My heart was going to the tens of the dozen. Um, Sherry jumped up, we both started panicking. Lucas came running out of his bedroom. It was just sheer panic. Carpenter Warren instantly realised what the noise was. Harry had made a hole in his bedroom wall and inserted a steel rod. Didn't even take any thinking about it. I knew he'd got a steel rod in there and I knew he was hitting it with a hammer. It was like a bomb going off. It was so loud. I mean, pff, y yeah, you would think that it was, uh, you know, something was about to come through the wall. Lucas was screaming, crying, um, terrified, obviously. Something like that, you don't go to sleep straight away because your nerves are, are, are you're on edge. And we must have eventually dropped off. I don't know how long we've been asleep, and again. It's like he knew he'd give us time to go to sleep. And as soon as we just dropped off, another massive bang again to the wall. Warren was just going he was ballistic, he, he was that close to going around there. I had to stop him from going around there. It was now the Smith's turn to call the police, who spoke to Harry. But it had no effect. 
From then on, the Smiths were to be jolted awake by banging from next door several nights every week for years. You can imagine sleep deprivation and before you even go to bed, you're wondering, is he going to do it? Are you going to be woke up? So then you can't get to sleep. But then you eventually get to sleep and yeah, you do it. Again and again and again. But Harry still thought he was the victim and continued to complain to police. What we saw was an escalation in complaints from, from Harry Street. Between March and May 2013, it becomes clear that at that point, actually Harry Street is causing the problems um, and the neighbours are the victims. The police came numerous times about the noise and most of the times they went round next door to speak to him and in no uncertain terms tell him what he was doing was wrong, but he didn't listen. Once again, Warren confronted Harry. This time, he was to receive a bizarre response. I need to find out what was going on with this bloke. Why are you banging? Why are you banging the wall all the time? And he said, you're banging, you're banging the wall. And I said, you know, I'm not. He said, I suppose it's the ghosts. He said, you'll be a ghost soon. And then just shut the door in my face. It's strange. It's very, very strange, man. When Warren told me that Harry said, you'll be a ghost soon, I just couldn't believe it. And Warren was just, I'm going to take no notice of him. He's just a silly old man, you know. But the long-term nighttime disturbances began to take their toll on the family. The worst thing to watch is obviously your children being affected by this. Um, Lucas was affected in a big, big way. He wouldn't, he, he wouldn't go up the stairs. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be without one of us at the side of him. He wouldn't go to bed by himself. Frustrated, Sherry decided to try to get answers from Harry's wife. I checked that Harry was nowhere to be seen. I was quite on edge, to be fair, thinking he may come back. I knocked on the window. All this time I was thinking, hurry up and answer. It wasn't that what I thought he, he might do to me, it was what he might do to his wife because she was talking to me. She looked panicky. I was thinking, oh my God, I better get her inside just in case her husband comes back. So I called her in. I just got straight to the point and I said, look, why is your husband continually banging our wall in the middle of the night? He's actually terrifying my son. Why is he doing it? And she replied, I don't know, Sherry, I don't know. I do try to stop him. He, he seems to wake up by clockwork. He wakes up at two, three o'clock every morning and decides to bang your wall. And he says, it's because you're banging our wall. And I said to her, you're obviously in the bedroom, so you know that we're not banging the wall, we're fast asleep at that time. And she replied, I try to stop him, and his reply is always, shut up! And she actually did that voice. Oh, it sent shivers through my body, and I actually asked her, does he have mental health issues? And she said, no, well, surely that is not normal behaviour. But Harry's aggression towards his neighbours didn't end there. I'm standing there on a, a Saturday night, it was about 9, 10 o'clock, just me and a friend talking on the patio. All of a sudden, Harry appears over the fence, hanging over the fence, um, waving this air gun, air rifle, I don't know what it was, it was dark. Um, I presumed it was an air rifle, saying, you don't know who I am, you don't know what I can do. And it was not making any sense to me what he was saying. He was just waving this gun in my direction, just to, I think, to make sure that I could see it. I told him, just do one, go away. And he did, and he did, he went away. Assuming it had been an air rifle, Warren once again took little notice of Harry's strange threat. But after five years of hell with Harry Street, Warren came to a drastic decision for his family. We had to move, but we had no choice. It was just getting too much. It was having an effect on 
our lives, our daily lives, sleep deprivation was, was really bad. Um, I ended up on antidepressants, so I had no choice but to move before, before something serious happened to him or to me. In June 2013, Warren and Sherry fled from their home because of their neighbour, Harry Street. This is my dad's house. And this is where I thought we'd be safe. What Warren didn't know was that the pleasant Birmingham suburbs where he and his family were living had a dark history. In 1978, only a few miles away, the Burkitt family had faced a similar problem with a neighbour. Jill Burkitt was 17 and lived with her mother, father and 19-year-old brother, Phil. She has asked not to be shown. I was seven when I moved in there. My mum um, was a secretary and um, my dad worked in a brewery. So, uh, yeah, my brother, he was a draftsman. He was training to be a draftsman, so... We were always laughing, dancing, singing, <laughs> joking. <laughs> the normal happy family. Jill's best friend Sharon lived in the neighbouring street. She is also asked not to be shown. We used to speak every day. We'd take my dog for a walk. And very often I'd call for her and we just had loads of fun and we went on holiday together. Uh, Jill and I, I went with her parents and she came with my parents. Oh, they were lovely people. Sharon remembers the estate as the perfect place for the two girls to grow up. It was safe, never felt threatened, never saw any crime or any threatening behaviour, never see, it just wasn't that sort of place. Andrew Road was on um, the Buslow Mill estate. Very rarely can I remember getting calls to any of the, the streets in Buslow Mill. It was a really low crime area. Everybody knew each other, really. It was a very friendly place. But there was one resident who wasn't particularly friendly. The Burkitt's next-door neighbour, 34-year-old Barry Williams, who lived with his elderly parents. I tried not to look at him, really, cos he always had, like, menacing eyes, and he'd, he'd stand at the bottom of my front path, and he'd just stare at me, and we all thought he was a bit mad. Soon after the Burkitts had moved in, Barry Williams appeared to have a problem with his neighbours. We were having a lovely time. It was Christmas, and oh, well, we'd been watching Malcolm and Warriors, and we were all laughing. The next minute, you know, the, the door knocked, and it was the police, and the neighbours were complaining we were being too noisy. It wasn't the case. We just got auntie and uncle and cousin round. It, it wasn't any more people than that. In the months that followed, the family tried to keep the noise down but complaints from next door kept on coming. One minute past 11, then we'd have a knock on the door quite regularly, and there'd be a policeman and he'd say, oh, you've got your TV on too loud, or uh, the neighbours are complaining. Well, we weren't really doing anything, watching TV like a normal family. But there was one member of the Burkitt family that Barry Williams seemed particularly annoyed by. Jill's brother, 19-year-old Phil. He was very popular, had a lot of friends. He was usually tinkering about with his car. Just a very popular lad. And my brother did have a guitar. And, you know, any normal teenager plays records, but obviously not light and not loud, cos obviously we were aware of the neighbours. Barry Williams made so many complaints about Phil that Jill's mum rearranged the household so that my brother couldn't be accused anymore. She moved his bedroom to my bedroom, so we had to have the box bedroom, <laughs> which I was delighted about. <laughs> you know, he was, what, 19, and, you know, I suppose he was full of bravado, and he laughed, he said, oh, that madman next door, that nutter next door, you know, he's after me again, and we didn't take it seriously. I wish we had, but we didn't. 30 years later, and just a few miles away, another family had been driven from their home by a complaining neighbour, Harry Street. The Smith family had been taken in by Warren's dad, Les, who lived just round the corner. 
well, said to me, Dad, I've got to move from there because I'm frightened of, um, you know, what I could do to him in one of these confrontations that he used to have with him. Well, we've got plenty of rooms here. You can come and live here. But their nightmare was far from over. I picked Lucas back up from school because I'd had a call to say that he wasn't feeling too good. And I said to Lucas, oh, well, shall we go up into the bedroom and watch a movie? The doorbell went and I said to Lucas, do you want to go and have a look in your granddad's bedroom to see who it is? I looked through here and I saw a white car which looked like Harry's car. As I got to about here, Lucas came to the top of the stairs. He said, Mom, I've looked out the window and it looks like Harry's car. I looked at the door and I could see the figure and it looked like Lucas's granddad and I said, it's not, it's granddad. And I opened this door and realised that it was Harry and he had his face up the glass and he said, I found you, you cannot escape me, you don't know what I can do. I was petrified. Coming up. We'd had six years of hell. All of a sudden my family are in serious danger from what I thought was just an old man. There was a significant number of shots. I remember that. To get away from their next door neighbor, the Smith family had fled to Warren's dad's house. But only a few weeks later, Harry Street had tracked them down. I was scared, I was angry. And then at this stage, I don't know, I built up some kind of courage from somewhere and said, oh, go away, you stupid old man. And then he went marching really, really fast down the pathway. It made me horrified. Uh, it's just that like, the man that was banging our walls and like haunting us for a while was standing at the door, tormenting my mum. We'd moved away from, from, to get away from him. Why was he looking for us? And by this stage now, I was in blind panic. She called me and said, Harry's just been at the front door, saying, I found you. You didn't know I'd find you. I was furious with him, and straight away I decided to go to his house to confront him. I wasn't really scared of, of what Harry was going to do to Warren. I was more scared of what Warren was going to do to Harry because, you know, he'd overstepped the mark and he'd come to the property, to his family, and he'd, he'd completely and utterly just overstepped the mark. At that point, it was the red mist had descended and I don't know if I pushed the door or whether he opened the door and stepped back. All I don't remember is I'm in, his I'm in his lounge, I'm in his living room, um, face to face with him. And when I say face to face, uh, our foreheads were actually touching. And I was still on the phone at the time to the police officer and she was saying to me, uh, tell him, I'd advise him not to go, tell him not to go to the property, advise him not to go to the property. He's already gone. And I threatened him. Don't you ever, ever call down to my dad's property again. And I was shouting, blinding. I was absolutely furious with this bloke. He just looked at me and just, he didn't say a word. He just growled like a dog and showed his teeth. The confrontation ended when the police arrived. Warren says he told the police his side of the story and went home to his family. But the next day, the Smiths got a shocking phone call. The phone rings and um, I answered the phone and it was a lady from West Midlands Police. She says that um, they've uncovered something, some previous on Harry Street and we all need to get out of the property. Is it really that serious? She said it absolutely is that serious. You just need not to be in the house tonight. Warren says he asked the officer what Harry had done but she told him he didn't need to know. We'd had six years of hell, and this was now gone into another level. It was, it was going to a different direction where all of a sudden my family are in serious danger from what I thought was just an old man. 
And I needed to know. I needed to know. I needed to know what I was what I was up against, really. Without knowing what Harry had done, the Smiths took the decision to return to Warren's dad's house after one night away. Warren tried to take what precautions he could to protect his family. In my mind, the only thing was petrol was going to be poured through the letterbox or something like that. Um, and that's what I prepared myself for. I just thought, what was he going to do to us? Like, would, what would happen if he come to the, the house and like, did something? The Smith family was living in terror, and they had no idea that Harry's story had started 35 years earlier with a man called Barry Williams, who in 1978 was living next door to the Burkitt family, just a few miles away. Ever since the Burkitts had moved in, Williams had been complaining about noise. Jill Burkitt was 17 at the time. We thought it was a nice street. We thought, oh, he was just a bit mad, and we didn't really take it seriously. If only we had moved. On one ordinary October evening, Jill had asked to borrow a book from her best friend, Sharon. We'd both been invited to an 18th birthday party, and Jill wasn't keen on going to the party because she was behind in her assignment. So I just said to her, if, if I'd got time, I would drop the book in to her house on my way out. But as I was running late myself, I didn't take the book. Sharon went to the party alone that evening, leaving Jill at home to study. I remember watching Crossroads and then I got my books out. My brother and my dad were working on his car. It must have been about seven-ish, I suppose. My mum was knitting. It was quiet. And the next thing, my brother burst in, clutching his arm, and he was saying, uh, oh, we've been shot. He came in with panic on his face, saying, um, um, that madman next door shot us. It was just like, what? You got, I couldn't just take it in, so I jumped up because I was worried about my dad. So I just shouted, my dad, dad, and I went out the front to open the front door because they were in the driveway, but Barry Williams entered my house from the back and uh, my mum was following me. I don't know whether she was going to try and stop me going out or, and so he shot us both from the back. Across the quiet neighbourhood, Residents were becoming aware that something terrifying was unfolding in Andrew Road. The first time I heard the gunfire was when my wife knocked on the door, just bringing the dog back from a walk. And that's when I heard what we thought were fireworks. And there was the crack, 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 crack. But there was a significant number of shots. I remember that. He shot me five times in the body and once in the leg and then twice in the arms. I think he just basically pumped bullets and wherever they landed, really. Seriously injured, 17-year-old Jill listened while Barry Williams shot at her brother again. There were just too many uh, shots and bullets and he was just lifeless. So I knew straight away, really. There was no hope for my brother. In just a matter of minutes, Barry Williams had shot Jill's entire family. It's like your whole body's covered in concrete and you just can't move or, you know, you're just trying to breathe, really. As I'd lay there, my mum was struggling for breath and I heard no more breath. So I heard her gasp the last breath. So I knew that she was gone. But despite terrible injuries, Jill was still alive. Barry Williams escaped the scene, taking his gun with him. I saw my friend Paul, who lived opposite. We just walked down a little bit. It's only about 10, 15 yards. And that's when we both just looked and saw somebody lying down by the side of the Triumph Spitfire. And that's when we actually both ran home and I, I dialed 999. The first officer on the scene, PC Colin Massey, had been told it was just an air rifle accident. I'm 
thinking that I'm attending a normal in everyday incident, something that's happened with an air rifle. There are people I'm aware of on both sides of the house, and as I take my first steps, I can see bodies. And I can tell within seconds that the first body I go to, which is I later found out is the father is dead. And I then go over to the others. I can see that the daughter, who I later found out is the daughter is still alive. I was in and out of consciousness in the drive. Obviously it was dark, but I was still aware there was a crowd at the bottom of my drive. One man came forward and he said, I don't really love the ambulance is on its way. I can remember trying to reassure the daughter, Jill, feeling very, very agitated whilst waiting for the ambulance. I could see the condition Jill was in and knew that she needed help and needed it there and then. Colin Massey was also the first to see the scene inside the house at Andrew Road. There was blood on the walls. There was splashes from blood from gunshot wounds. There was bullet casings lying on the floor. And I could see the mother and the son uh, lying in the hallway. Very, very quickly ascertained that they were both dead. As the first senior officer on the scene, Chris Denley called for armed backup and knocked on the door of Barry Williams' house. I think his mother answered the door and mother and father were sat in the front room watching television and all this had gone on outside their house and they were oblivious to it. We had to explain to them what had happened. Um, and I, I, I know that was half past seven when we went in there because the television was on and the theme tune to Coronation Street was playing as we, as we walked into the house. And that, that's very vividly in my, in my mind. I mean, over the years I've, I've been involved in, in various uh, investigations, but this was probably the worst. Later that night, Jill's best friend Sharon passed the house on her way home from the party to which the two girls had been invited. All I seem to remember is all the windows, the, all the glass was out of the front windows and the, the door, front door was open. And I just remember being conscious I needed to get home, find out what, what on earth has, has happened to Jill's house. My mum and dad were all in tears and then they just told me that Jill had been shot um, by the neighbour and she was critically ill in hospital. I just went numb really. By the time he was finally arrested the following day, Barry Williams had shot at least eight people, including the owners of a petrol station in nearby Nuneaton. In total, five people were dead. I remember seeing him in the custody suite, and I remember to this day thinking, how can such an insignificant man cause so much carnage? When he was arrested, Williams told a police officer You'd have shot them if you'd have been me. They weren't human beings, they were things. William said, after I'd done it, I felt better. They weren't noisy at all. They were a normal family, I think, from what I could gather. That was his, his excuse or his reason for, for killing them. I find that very hard to come to terms with, but that was the, the reason he gave. In March 1979, while Jill was still in hospital, Williams, diagnosed with schizophrenia, pleaded guilty to five counts of manslaughter. He was sent to the High Security Psychiatric Hospital, Broadmoor. Despite having been shot eight times, 17-year-old Jill survived and went to live with her aunt and uncle. I just was determined he wasn't going to ruin my life like that. <laughs> and uh, my mum would not have wanted him to have ruined my life like that. Eventually, Jill got married, and against the doctor's predictions, she had a family of her own. They did say that because a lot of my injuries were in that area, that I probably wouldn't be able to have children, but uh, I did. <laughs> I was very, very lucky. I felt absolutely the luckiest person on earth, because that's all I ever wanted, children, really. What Jill didn't know was that news of Barry Williams was going to take her right back and have her fearing for her safety. I was just blown away. 
I was just absolutely scared, Steve. I was shocked he'd been let out so soon. Um, I knew one day would come, he would be released, and I always believed he would come back and get me and finish the job. I had no idea they were even thinking of that, and it was just, I was just totally shocked, dumbfounded. After his release, Barry Williams had come back to Birmingham, and his return was going to have a devastating impact on Warren and Sherry Smith. He said, you need to know about this man. He was right, yeah, we did need to know. It's just a completely and utterly devastating, sick at the pit of the stomach feeling. The Smith family were living in fear after the police told them their former neighbour, Harry Street, was highly dangerous. But they still didn't know what he'd done. After three terrifying nights, the couple had a call from one of the neighbours at their old house next to Harry's. The neighbour found us and said initially the police were there. And, and then she rings back. And it's like a running commentary and tells us armed response are there. And the next thing, the bomb squad are there. And then there's skies in army uniforms, there's all kinds going on, they're cordoned off all the road. Concerned about what might be happening, Warren and Sherry drove to the home that they had fled. We pulled over and there's a police officer outside who I recognised had been one of the many police that had called round in the previous years. And Sherry straight away started asking him, is he on the loose? What's going on? My son's in the local school. He said to us, don't worry. He's been arrested. Your son is in no danger. He said to us, you don't know about this. And we said, know about what? And he said, you need to know about this man. He was right, yeah, we did need to know. For Harry Street to go to the lengths that he did in terms of searching and finding them out, that then did start to set alarm bells ringing in terms of th th this is not common behaviour and, and that eventually was how we came to identify uh, Harry Street's true identity. Harry Street was actually Barry Williams. He was responsible for killing uh, five people following a neighbour dispute in 1978. We were sitting at Warren's dad's house and we were all gathered in the lounge and we were told to wait there for the police officers to come as they had something to discuss with us. And they said that actually Harry Street was not actually Harry Street, he was actually Barry Williams and that he'd served 15 years in Broadmoor and that he'd slaughtered his neighbours for noise. <sighs> Oh, God, oh, it's just a completely and utterly devastating, sick at the pit of the stomach feeling where all these times he's told us, you don't know who I am and what I can do. He could have done it to us. Warren's dad, Les, remembers the moment he heard about the fate that his son's family had so narrowly escaped. I came in and the two police were there. And uh, one looked over at me as I came in from the back here, from the garden. He said, Daddy says, you'll never guess, you know, what Ali's done. He said, he's, he's shot eight people, he said. He's killed five of them. And, you know, I couldn't believe it at the time. I thought, God. At Harry Street's house, next door to the Smith's old home in Hazelville Road, the police had found six guns, ammunition and a homemade bomb. All the emotions started coming from that point. We'd just been sitting ducks, really. It was completely out of my hands. It doesn't matter what I would have done. I couldn't have defended against an automatic and gone. Just a few miles away, Jill Burkett was about to hear the news she'd been dreading for 35 years. It's just a normal working day for me. The police were waiting for me in reception. They said, 
It's about Barry Williams, who's now called Harry Street. I said that he's almost done the same thing again to another nice family. And he was actually living just about six miles from where I lived in Birmingham. All that time when he was released, I'd been afraid he was going to find me and he was actually just living down the road. The police admit that they should have known Harry Street's true identity. Inside of the police environment, we, we did not know that information. That, that's not by the way to say we shouldn't have known it. That information might have been captured on the systems that were around then, but it certainly wasn't known in 2013 to the police officers that were dealing with it at the time. In October 2014, Barry Williams went to court to face 10 charges, including possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life and possession of a controlled explosive. Jill Burkett decided to go to the trial and face the man who 35 years before had killed her entire family. People didn't want me to go in and I was determined I was gonna go in there because stuff was being said about my family and you know, I wanted to hear it this time. I didn't have the chance first time round. And um, I, I wanted to be there for my family. I was pretty, pretty scared to face him in court. He did look at me. He looked away. We just looked and then he looked away. And he was so agitated. It was like he felt contempt at being there. It was like, why am I being here? What is, why are you here? He, he, there was no remorse in their eyes at all. Barry Williams, AKA Harry Street, was sent to a secure psychiatric hospital and the judge ordered that he be held indefinitely. He never admitted intent to kill, but the judge was convinced that a copycat mass murder was only narrowly averted. The similarities were just uncanny. It was like it was if it was reenacting exactly the same thing. All those years, years on, really. How are you, chill? You all right, love? Oh, I'm all right. See ya. It was at the trial that Warren and Sherry Smith met Jill Burkett for the first time. We're both very fond of Jill. You know, she's, she's a, a warm, honest person. And the way she, she went into court and she faced that man that was, um, the last time she'd seen him, he, he was slaughtering her family and, and, and pumping bullets into her. I mean, for her to do that, it takes some real special person. And for Jill, 35 years after she lost her family, the latest twist in the story has had one positive effect. The only good thing out of it, Jill, is your family being vindicated because we were a normal family, just like your family was. It was so misrepresented at the time. Um, people were saying, we were noisy neighbours. So, although I felt sorry for Warren and his family, that really, in a way, vindicates my family because another nice family who just lived a normal life like we did was, you know, being treated in the same way that we were. And I firmly believe w they would have had the same fate as my family. On Christmas Eve 2014, Barry Williams died of a heart attack in Ashurst Secure Hospital. His victims are still coping with the legacy of the man who was their next door neighbour. I mean, I've had nightmares still now. I think it's had a big effect on me because I couldn't have done anything about it. It was completely out of my hands. The end result was going to be the same. And that's something I could, couldn't do anything about. And, and, and that haunted me for a, a long time. You can't not see what that man took from me. My children never know their grandparents. I'm sure they're looking down feeling proud, but you know, I still have that heartbreak that they never met them. I'll always miss my family. You know, that never goes away, even 30 odd years. You can catch more shocking tales of the nightmare neighbour next door as the new series continues next Wednesday at 8. Next tonight, it's new undercover benefits cheat.